Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, ECLM is my, uh, my favorite uh, event of the programming year. I think it's just fantastic uh, that the guys have um, decided to put on another one. It's really excellent. And very glad that they invited me to speak here. I've been here uh, speaking once before about uh, Slime, uh, about uh, six years ago, maybe. And I know that the talk has been remembered because several people have come up to me uh, last night and said, hey, Luke, don't screw up like last time and run out of slides halfway through your time slot. So uh, thank you very much for that. So, um, so I'm, I'm here to talk now about uh, the most exciting thing happening uh, in Listland in uh, 100 years. Uh, so you're, you're really in for a treat. Um, uh, it's a, a company that you'll hear all about now, uh, after I tell you about me. And before I get too far in the talk, I would like to request my friend Christoph to wave his hand discreetly like this any time I start talking faster than the human can understand, because this is a tendency of mine when I get excited, and this is a very exciting talk. So you are going to hear some extremely fast talking. Uh, I'm from Australia. Um, I grew up there as a, as a Java hacker, and uh, then decided that uh, that wasn't good enough, and I came to Europe to hack uh, other things. Um, I'd done most of my list packing in, uh, in Sweden, and have been uh, traveling around European list events from there. Um, I've been programming Lisp for about, uh, well, a long time now, since around 98. Um, I'm mostly, the, the most useful thing I've done in the community uh, was uh, creating Slime together with uh, Helmut Eller and uh, hacking on that for about a year up to version uh, 1.0. Um, and uh, another program called CL Build, which I guess Zach is going to tell us about uh, its obsolescence uh, in just a, just a moment. Um, and the whole time that I've been working around here, the last uh, 10 years or so, I've always had really fantastic jobs. It has been uh, something I've been very, very lucky in. So uh, when I lived in Sweden, I was uh, hacking Erlang. <laughs> well, I, I've chosen uh, very, very, my, my colleagues very carefully, you might say. Um, so I've had a fantastic run. So I, I hacked Erlang for about uh, six or seven years in, in Sweden with all of the guys who, who invented that and, uh, and all of their little um, companies. Uh, recently, I've been uh, doing uh, fourth programming on the OLPC EXO, doing um, uh, firmware development and uh, hardware debugging, which has been really cool, and working with uh, a guy there who did, um, who did SUMS, uh, hardware debugging, firmware, and all that, which is really fun. Um, around the time of the last ECLM, I just finished a stint of small talk hacking, where I got to hang out with uh, Alan Kay and, and his group and, and do cool stuff like uh, argue fourth versus small talk with Alan Kay over lunch, which was extremely cool. And uh, now I have something even cooler than all of those things, which is a list packer company, uh, which is uh, coming out of uh, this uh, conference series, actually, and people who I've met uh, around here, and many of whom are in the room. So this is a talk about that company. Uh, and it's not going to be a especially technical talk. I'm not going to show any. Uh, I'm not going to show any code anyway. It's about um, it's about the background of, of who is in this company called Techlo Networks that uh, we've been working on for a year and a half or so. Uh, what the problem is that we're solving, uh, what it's all about, and um, and how it's going, and where we're up to, and how far in the in the great success story we are uh, so far. Uh, so the community that it comes from is actually two communities. One of which is this one, and I was looking back a little bit on seeing um, where I know you guys from, and uh, it's a lot of stuff actually. So I listed here just the list of events that I've been to, and not even all of them, but it's a lot, starting in just uh, 2004. So it's kind of, uh, it amazes me to see uh, what a, what a uh, active community we actually have um, to do so much in so little time. So through these and hacking uh, S, uh, Slime and SBCL related stuff, I've made a lot of very good uh, technical friends. And uh, those people are, uh, as you'll see, are coming into this uh, company of ours. Um, and then the other half of the community has been uh, what I was doing before in, in Sweden. So. Uh, I don't think that it's really wide, widely known how cool the, um, the obscure programming language hacker uh, experience has been up there. So uh, I got to see it from pretty early on. I moved to Sweden in 2000 and uh, worked with guys who were doing Erlang hacking. And at the time, uh, they were all working in, in Ericsson uh, in a kind of obscure, obscure positions uh, without much respect and, and uh, really uh, not, not getting to do very cool stuff. But it all changed suddenly when, um, when a company called uh, Blue Tail was founded. Um, so a woman called Jane Valrud came along and saw the, all of the hackers and thought, well, saw them as very much like the kind of people 
that are in the room now. So there were some very, very good technical people who can do wonderful things and just need uh, you know, the opportunity to go and uh, really make things happen. And they started a company with about 10 of them, uh, 10 of the senior people who had been you know, developing this stuff and, and doing their thing for a really long time. And it was a really big success. So this was during the dot-com era, and uh, they managed to uh, build a product and get bought up and become a development uh, unit of a major networking equipment uh, manufacturer, which was a really good thing. And I worked for that company as well. So, um, so we then uh, got a lot of experience with uh, getting companies going and building networking products and, uh, and all of that. And it created a really amazing network effect over the coming years. So now uh, that you have this whole constellation of companies up there, which are basically started by basically very much the same people as uh, sitting here, um, one by one, making little companies that become very prosperous and uh, really, really good for them and, and make them uh, happy and independent. So um, I worked also for one called Synapse. Um, and it, uh, it was a tele or is a telecom equipment supplier. They make the product that uh, makes sure everybody's phones work with all of their internet and uh, picture messaging and all of that kind of thing. And uh, I had a really great experience there helping to build a company up and, and see it go to um, about 150 different countries having the system installed and, and um, you know, being part of the, the world uh, mobile telephony uh, experience. And uh, well, there's a whole bunch of others. So the thing that's happened now in the space of about eight years is that they kind of ran out of uh, people to some extent. So now they have so many companies uh, doing cool stuff that everyone who is kind of, you know, of the same profile as everybody here is, is basically spoken for and has a really good job in a really cool company uh, working with their friends. And so it seemed very uh, clear to me that they needed to, well, the, the chain reaction should continue with uh, some other people. And it seemed very obvious that uh, the Lisp community uh, as we meet at ILC is just the perfect one because there is you know, a dozen companies worth of uh, really cool people here. Um, so it's, it's really nice to see if uh, things can carry over a little bit. And so uh, I formulated the intention to start another company in this network and bring it down uh, as a, a first uh, Lispy, uh, Lispy extension of the experience. And uh, it turned out that lots of people were interested. And uh, so we have a company now. Uh, we are a uh, telecom um, network infrastructure provider called Tecla Networks, and we're, we're 10 people now. Um, and uh, uh, four, of, four of us are in the room now, so if I point them out and ask them to just uh, briefly stand up and say hello, we have Christoph. Christoph is our chief scientist. Uh, that means that he is expected to answer very, very, very uh, difficult questions correctly. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's spending much of his time uh, hacking R, which is a very Lisp-like uh, language with us. Uh, we have Thies Stau. Where are you, Thies? Stand up. So Thies and I know each other from the Stockholm uh, Lisp meeting. Um, uh, at the time, I think he was hacking uh, Nintendo DS uh, with his own homemade assembler written in Common Lisp and, uh, and such like. And he is now um, mostly hacking Lisp and traveling around to very interesting places um, meeting interesting people and, and uh, doing nice work. We have uh, Tobias Rittweiler. Tobias. He is uh, also, uh, so he and I have worked very much on uh, Slime, mostly at different times, but, uh, but yeah, we know each other from Slime hacking, and uh, he knows everybody else through SVCL hacking. And uh, now he is tr also traveling the world, uh, doing nice work, and uh, hacking this. Uh, he is actually going direct from ECLM to St. Petersburg to um, do some exciting uh, technical work with us, which is really nice. Uh, this icon here, of course, is uh, Juho Snellman, a uh, famous uh, SPCL hacker uh, who, who is a little bit camera shy, so uh, he gets this treatment. So uh, he has um, hopped, hopped off his uh, boring, tiresome job at Google in Switzerland and come and uh, work with us instead. And he is uh, hacking all of the scary stuff that the rest of us are slightly too scared to hack, uh, often involving uh, C and C++ uh, as it happens, which he writes very, very well. Um, and there is uh, me, of course, uh, down there. So then on the other half, we have a whole bunch of people from the other world um, who have been doing cool uh, telecom-related companies and, and were, were keen to work with a new set of uh, good programmers. So we have uh, Jane Valru. So our CEO in this company is uh, the same person who uh, actually got Erlang open sourced and created the first uh, Erlang startup company and has been doing uh, a lot of uh, really nice 
companies with technical people, going around and finding techie types who uh, are good at programming and, and uh, don't necessarily know much about very much else, and organizing them into a company and setting them off in the world. So she is our CEO, which is fantastic. Um, my friend Sean, he is our uh, head of sales and marketing, and he is also a very well-known uh, Erlang programmer, having been uh, developing telecom systems for the past 20 years or so, um, also uh, came along. Uh, this clown here is a Finnish chap called uh, Bedri, who is uh, making sure all of our projects get through. Um, he is, uh, he is uh, making sure that people turn up in the right countries with the right hardware at the right times, and that everything is going very well. We've got a nice uh, finance guy who's administrating the entire company, single-handedly, Michael Halpern. And we have uh, another friend who has uh, joined us from Ericsson in a long uh, career of uh, telecom system deployment and support. So we're a company now with, uh, with one of everything in the last uh, year and a half. We have uh, five hackers and uh, one of every other uh, function. And uh, we've been traveling around uh, quite a lot of uh, funny places. Uh, we've been uh, had our headquarters in Kuala Lumpur uh, to start with uh, for about half of last year, uh, which is this city you see here, which was very nice. We then, um, being as all of us uh, joined the company but lived in different countries, it took us a while to figure out what a good uh, or a reasonable compromise would be. So we started with Kuala Lumpur where we had uh, uh, an interested customer. Then we relocated to a fishing village uh, on the west coast of Sweden for uh, summer of last year, which was very nice. Uh, then we shifted uh, for the autumn and winter to the south coast of England in a place called Mudderford in uh, Dorset. And since then, we've, um, we've hung up our boots in uh, Switzerland. And we uh, are based in Zurich uh, these days. About half of us are living there, and the other half um, are uh, virtually here with uh, Skype and uh, coming to, to visit and staying in an apartment that the company has uh, for, for out-of-towners who we have to drag over now and again. So I mean, it's a really lovely little uh, company. Um, Ten people, everyone, a uh, friend of mine from, from somewhere or other, and just, just really nice. Uh, so that's the people. And then what we're actually doing is, um, is we're making the mobile internet work better. So we wanted to pick uh, a general problem area where there was explosive growth and a lot of things happening, and you know, there was just an exciting place to be. And we picked mobile internet because it is uh, growing phenomenally. So uh, what, what seems to be happening in the world now is that mobile networks are taking over as the way people will get their internet. So 3G networks and LTE and WiMAX and these kind of things are really on the move. Uh, they're, having a lot of, um, they're having a lot of trouble uh, now trying to compete with the uh, fixed DSL and that kind of thing, but they're really um, making headway. And they have about 65%, I think, annual growth in the amount of traffic going over these networks, so it's absolutely exploding. And in a lot of countries, it's the only internet they will ever have. They will, they will leapfrog the entire uh, fixed network. So it's cool. Uh, people are spending billions and billions and billions of dollars on building up these networks. And uh, we think we can uh, help them spend that money more, more wisely. Um, and and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different problems that people are working on. So when you look at someone spending a fortune on a network, well, people will come to them and they will say, well, OK, you wouldn't have to spend so much if you can press your content down a bit smaller. You wouldn't need so many routers. Or, um, or if you come in and you tweak all of your radio parameters, it will be very good. And they're doing all of these things. And uh, we, have, we have identified a problem that we had some uh, background familiarity with, but that was not being addressed by anybody uh, directly uh, when we started, or now, which is uh, the behavior of TCP over, um, over wireless networks. So um, I think TCP uh, is something that is really taken, taken for granted. It's, uh, it's been designed from, it's from the very, very early days of the internet. It's how basically everything uh, communicates. It's extremely well debugged. There has been research going on to it, uh, into it continuously forever and ever. But the interesting thing is that it's in normal use of, um, of mobile broadband networks like 3G, it's making a lot of mistakes. And you're actually getting a lot of the, um, the poor experience that people get and the feeling that uh, mobile networks are flaky is actually not from the mobile networks themselves. A lot of it actually comes from uh, the TCP on the server and the client getting a bit confused by things um, that the network is doing. So small, small uh, glitches and, and uh, misbehaviors of the network become amplified by um, confusing TCP state machines. And uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting to dig into. So I will now give you a brief tutorial on uh, 
the funny things that TCP does over mobile networks. Using a marvelous uh, tutorial uh, from our very own Christoph. So, this is how you can uh, look at a TCP connection. You have a diagram with a line representing a client. You have another line which represents a server. You have some other uh, regular ticks indicating the flow of time. This is uh, 100 millisecond intervals uh, going downwards uh, in time. Uh, and then when you want to show the communication between a client and a server, you have um, you just draw a line from the client over here saying he's sent a packet over here to the server. The server has received it. Um, and this uh, orange, orange lines are for SYN packets, which mean, may we speak? This is a connection open request. This is followed traditionally by a SYNAC, which is an acknowledgement of this saying, yes, uh, I'm listening on port 80, no problem, uh, let's have a connection. And here you see it has been a 100 millisecond round trip between the SYN and the acknowledge uh, coming back, which you can see by the spacing of the lines. Uh, this is followed by an acknowledgement of the SYNAC, which is the so-called three-way handshake. And then once that is done, then the two sides can actually send packets containing meaningful data, uh, which we color in blue, uh, which can be any kind of uh, payload. And uh, after data is sent, you will get an acknowledge, which you can kind of see in green there under the other blue data packet. And the connection makes forward progress. Um, Packets go along, every data packet is acknowledged by an acknowledged packet. Eventually, one side will say that it's, uh, it's done enough now, thank you very much, and send a fin, um, to which the other will acknowledge and send its own fin. And once that is acknowledged, the connection is done. So this is uh, how a TCP connection looks uh, in, uh, in theory. And then what we look at now is how it looks in practice when you actually start constructing these graphs uh, automatically from packet traces over real networks and see what, what really happens uh, between the two sides. So, this is a, uh, a very straightforward um, TCP connection, uh, HTTP download over a 3G network where nothing particularly funny happens. You see, uh, as before, a SYN and a SYNAC, and then you see uh, a blue HTTP request going across this way and you start to see blue data flowing back. The first packet is the HTTP response, and uh, the, the next packets are some more of the payload. You have green acknowledgements flowing back, and when the acknowledgements are received, the server is then confident to send the next parts, and it continues to flow. And you see that it's uh, ramping up in speed over time. So in the beginning here, it's just a few packets being sent because the server doesn't yet have a feel for the speed of the network and how much data it should be sending to get a decent uh, transfer speed. So it starts off conservatively, and when the acknowledgements come back, uh, which here takes about 180 milliseconds, say, uh, then it sends a bit, a bit quicker and a bit quicker, and by quicker I mean more at the same time, and uh, eventually it becomes like this, looking very thick um, and really making progress. So when we look at uh, when we look at the way data is being transferred through a network with TCP, this is, this is what we want to see here, where it's very, very blue. There's always stuff getting sent through. And what we kind of don't want to see is more like what you have in the beginning, where time is passing and nothing is arriving. Um, and in a, in a simple case where the, the latency is very steady, as it is here, and nothing is getting lost, it's, it's as simple as that. But it becomes more exciting when, um, when you start working on a network with unusual things happening. So here, everything begins as in the previous trace. But here, this is very anomalous in internet terms. You lose, uh, heavily lose packets for a period of time. So there's about 300 milliseconds there where about 50% of all packets being sent to uh, get dropped. And then uh, the packets that do get through generate acknowledgments that come back and kind of inform the sender that something has happened to these packets. It can infer from the act stream that uh, some things have been missed and it retransmits, which is what you see in purple. So the little circles represent packets that were sent from this side but never received on the other side. So that's a packet loss. 
and the purple is a retransmission. So when the network is dropping packets, what you see is um, typically a, a stall uh, on the TCP layer. So here it's lost a bunch of stuff. It's partially managed to retransmit, but somehow, uh, probably because the retransmission was also lost, it just hasn't quite had the smarts to uh, keep uh, blasting traffic through. So what happens is it falls back on a timeout here. And now the sender at this point has sent everything it's comfortable with sending until there is some event that makes it happy again. And none of these acknowledgements are doing that, so it's waiting for a timeout then. And you have about one second there with uh, nothing being transmitted at all. And then uh, the server says, well, I've now timed out and I will start resending. And it starts dribbling data out. And what you, what you see uh, here is that it's, it really is dribbling it out. So you've had, I mean, in total here, you've had a few hundred milliseconds of uh, strange anomalous network behavior. And then everything has clicked back to being perfectly good. But there is a kind of a memory effect on the connection where for, well, for quite a while, uh, several seconds, you have uh, hardly anything going on. And that's a mistake in the TCP level, and that's uh, the kind of uh, problem that is actually um, responsible for a lot of the bad feeling in, in mobile networks that we are working on fixing. Um, and just to show a, a somewhat more extreme example, a connection that starts off much the same, loses one uh, single packet here, and then also has a very long spike in latency. For some reason, the network has not delivered these packets on time, it's buffered them perhaps due to a switch of cells or something like that. And before they can actually be delivered and acknowledged, the server has timed out and decided it's been too long and something is up and it's going to start retransmitting. And the combination of that retransmission timeout signaling that things are bad and that single packet loss uh, also, which will be detected and be a sign of badness, has a, a really detrimental effect there. You see, it goes into a kind of a panic mode on the server then. And you have just tiny, whiny bits of data uh, being dribbled out for quite a long time. And again, you had two very small events happening over a matter of a few hundred milliseconds, and it has a memory effect, which uh, really slows things down. And this is, um, this is the problem we're here to solve. So um, our product, or our, the problem that we attack is what should the server really be doing? And how should it really be interpreting these events? And how should it be always making sure that the network has data to deliver? so that the throughput uh, you actually get uh, on all of your transfers matches what the network has available to give you. And and to see how, uh, how important it is, this is um, a graph showing the measurement of how fast the network actually goes when you try to download stuff. So it's a, it's a kind of a difficult and subtle question to say how fast is a, is a broadband network. If, um, if you just download one, one time, you might get a speed around 300 kilo, kilobits a second, or you might get a speed around uh, one megabit a second, and you have to actually download lots and lots of times to understand uh, whether something is fast or slow. So um, what, we've, what we have here is a, a small benchmark where we've downloaded a file maybe 20 or 30 times and just plotted the most common um, speeds uh, that you get. And this is a characterization then of the speed of a network, and we can say that, well, the most common speed is around uh, 700 kilobits a second, say, but it's also got a, a bunch of slow connections that have uh, fallen down, which looks problematic and will be upsetting to uh, users. So we made our, our Sambal TCP, um, which is a, a new TCP implementation implemented uh, as a router sitting in between the standard internet server run by Amazon or whoever and the standard uh, TCP on the mobile, whether it's a laptop or an iPhone or whatever. And we sit in the middle and we take over all of the decisions uh, that are being made uh, by the TCP sender and try and make that graph look nicer. Try and have um, the, the TC, try to have the total throughput match whatever the network has available and never um, clamp it down due to uh, TCP artifacts. And let me show you how it looks. So um, when we have our system in a network, uh, when you look at the trace, you actually have three points now. Um, you have a client over here, and you have a server over here. But then in the middle, uh, you have our device, which is able to make uh, decisions from the middle point. And you can see that when the connection is established, uh, a SYN packet comes through. And in this case, we actually forward it directly on towards the server. 
So um, in, order to do, in order to get this looking just how we like it, we've written a complete uh, TCP IP stack uh, from scratch. Because if you, if you would use a, a transparent proxy, for example, then at this point, you would be already accepting the connection um, ahead of whether you knew the server was really listening, uh, this kind of thing, and what you really knew. Um, so you would be preemptively opening uh, connections, which is, is not so nice, because then you, you're really responsible for it, and you can't, um, if you have any kind of an error, you will take out the session, and, and well, it becomes messy. So here we allow the SYN through. We allow the SYN ACK also to come directly through. Uh, then when the HTTP request comes, it's basically the same, but we are actually acknowledging it then out from the middle. Um, so as soon as any data packet reaches us in the middle, we actually buffer it locally and take responsibility for its retransmission if anything should happen and acknowledge it immediately, uh, which has the really nice effect then of uh, basically halving the effective latency uh, that each side will experience. And then of course we also forward the data packet on immediately through the other side to its final destination. Um, and then here, that was the HTTP request. Now the response starts to come, and it comes, um, it comes more quickly because by the time the first round of data packets reach us, we preemptively acknowledge them out from here and start pulling more data out uh, much more quickly. So in this example, it's the, the time the server has to wait between sending data and getting it acknowledged and being able to send more is approximately halved by our being there, being able to take responsibility for the onward passage of those packets and say, this is cool, um, send us some more. Um, and so if you compare, uh, well, if you compare this uh, previous one where it takes a while to get ramped up and when you look at ours, it's just uh, a lot quicker there. And it also means we can make uh, faster and better decisions. So if you want to look at a really chaotic uh, network, then uh, here, for instance, is um, a trace with crazy stuff happening with a normal TCP. Uh, it's sending, getting started. It runs along. It loses a few packets uh, here. Starts uh, making the retransmissions once those are detected. The network starts behaving very strangely. All of the acknowledgements here were held up for about a second unexpectedly. And the latency is, is very, very jittery. And it's, it's doing the best that it can. And here it uh, has some bad luck with a lot of packet losses. More spikes in the latency. And here it gets real trouble when uh, all of the data that it's been sending, uh, the acknowledgement to all of that is lost and it, uh, it's then kind of uh, a bit rudderless and it doesn't know what's happening anymore. Uh, and it has to wait on a timeout. And then you have uh, several seconds uh, passing before it makes an attempt to retransmit. Then you get one retransmission attempt. The acknowledgement of that uh, is lost and that's really bad, then it doubles the timeout because it's very conservative and you have another many, many more seconds coming through. And finally, it uh, starts making some progress again. So this is the kind of thing that happens when you, if you're on a mobile network and your throughput is, you know, it's going okay for a while and then suddenly it bottoms out for a long time and you wonder whether you should abort or retry. Uh, it's when these uh, kind of things are happening. The radio has been acting strange and it's really confused the TCP endpoints. So if you compare with, uh, with our stack, when we have a really crazy network, then, well, here we are. Uh, this packet goes very slightly back in time, which is uh, an artifact of the uh, construction of the traces and the synchronization of the clocks. Uh, so just mentally shifted by, a, by a five milliseconds or so. And uh, here we go. Uh, the network is still being crazy. So the acknowledgements here getting delayed as they were the other time. But as far as the server is concerned, everything is, is actually very nice. Every time it sends a packet, it gets uh, an acknowledgement back uh, very, very quickly and reliably because it doesn't have to traverse the radio before that happens. So as far as the server is concerned, every packet it sends is acting immediately, and as far as our Sambal TCP is concerned, it's actually okay. So we, we're used to networks kind of uh, bucking and jumping, and we just hang on to them and, and get as much data through as we can. So here you see there are a whole bunch of acknowledgement packets being lost. There's a big spike in the latency there, and uh, what we do is just continuously get data through. So we send our data here, and then for a while, it's suspicious that nothing uh, came through, no acknowledgements arrived. But instead of waiting a very long time, like uh, three seconds or something, for a timeout, we just send a very, very small zero-byte probe to say, well, you know, how's it going over there? Are you still there? And, and always, uh, always being careful to keep the connection um, ticking over and always being holding on to the thread of control. And so when you page through the graphs uh, from our system, 
uh, there is a conspicuous absence of real cases where the sender has stopped and, and is confused and is not putting data in the network to be delivered. And um, yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time traveling around the world actually and taking traces from networks with commercial um, internet dongles and just seeing all the really funky things um, that, that happen on the radio and staring at traces like this and asking ourselves, well, what, what should a TCP uh, do in this situation? And eventually we came up with a sufficient collection of algorithms that uh, we felt, okay, it's a, it's a product now. We can put this in a network and it will take over the decisions and TCPs will no longer lose, lose connections or get confused by packet drops and it will just go smoothly. And the throughput that you will get from your network will be um, the speed of the network rather than the speed of the network minus TCP artifacts. So, uh, it, it actually works, as it turns out. So, <laughs> we, um, the way we tend to test it is um, we do uh, A-B comparisons where you say, well, okay, I'm going to do this uh, benchmark of some kind, downloading a, a whole bunch of web pages or uh, files or whatever your workload is, and what is the distribution uh, without Sambal in red versus uh, with Sambal in blue? And it tends to be very good. So in this particular example, you see uh, two nice things. One is that the, the average throughput has been increased by 20%, which is very nice in itself. And also you see that uh, we've eliminated here the really slow points and everything, all of our data points are 512 kilobits per second or above, which is really nice. So it, it's making it a better network. You have more consistency and uh, higher speed. And we're really happy about that. And so we uh, built a product out of it. We decided that it was promising enough. Um, and this is what it is. So this is what we are now um, marketing. It is a uh, Hewlett Packard server, completely standard hardware. Um, and we sell it to people who are operating mobile phone networks. So like your Vodafones and so on. So we have uh, two 10 gigabit a second fiber ports on one side where you plug in your mobile network. We have two 10 gigabit a second fiber plugs on the other side where you plug in your internet. And we have a regular ethernet port that you connect to for basic administration and so on. And if you put this into a network, it, it has that uh, transformational um, property. Your network goes from being uh, slow and inconsistent to being uh, less slow and less inconsistent. And, um, and that's, uh, that's what uh, our company is about. And we built it, we traveled all around, uh, talking with such people who, who would uh, speak to us about this product, you know, do you like the sound of it? Yes, it sounds very good. Um, and but the real excitement happened then when we went to um, the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona uh, this February. So this was a completely terrifying uh, experience actually. So we had, <laughs> we had just spent uh, about uh, a year um, developing all of this stuff and, and getting all of our algorithms the way we wanted and then building it as a product. And now we're actually going out to the world at a, a massive uh, fair where every company in the entire industry turns up. Uh, and you have keynotes from Eric Schmidt from Google and, and all of these kind of things. It's just completely uh, insane and massive. And we are there uh, exhibiting and being able to then talk to all the other companies we've heard of and ask them questions like, yeah, we're doing this. Do you do this too? Um, and uh, you know, we're, we, we have this invention, would you like to put it in your network? And we really didn't know um, what to expect. There were, there were many things you could have said to us that would have just made us uh, give up and, uh, and go home. <laughs> so it was, it was really uh, a really terrifying uh, experience. But it went really, really, really well. So this, uh, this is a picture of our booth. Uh, in the, the furthest corner of the trade show you can possibly imagine, where we, we uh, went for a few days a whole bunch of us in our matching blue uh, Teclo Networks uh, jerseys, and we talked with uh, network operators who were there looking for interesting new technologies, and we talked with um, system integrators who were looking for products uh, that they could buy and sell into the networks who they are accustomed to working with, and we talked to the other vendors. And amazingly, everybody said uh, what we hoped that they would say. <laughs> So the, the mobile network operators said, that sounds uh, really fantastic and interesting. Come and show it to us in our network, uh, which was just marvelous. And we got a, a long list of the names of uh, operators who were very amenable to, to trying our system. As we were there saying, free trials, no problem, come along. Um, the sales channels also had a very similar reaction. They had a lot of stories of other people selling systems, um, doing one kind of optimization or another that were hitting uh, performance issues. So they, the message from them was that if we can do anything good at uh, 10 gigabits a second per relatively cheap server, then that's fantastic. And we, we 
get, have a whole segment of the market that is kind of closing to people with heavier solutions. And uh, the other vendors who, who we feared would, would have said, yes, we've been doing that for a very long time. They all, uh, they all said, cool, you know, that's really nice, <laughs> which was, made us feel very happy. So uh, then we, then we uh, finally, in February this year, we realized that uh, we have a product, we have a window of opportunity, and we should just uh, go for it like hell. And uh, that's what we've been doing uh, all year, actually. So um, uh, amazingly enough, in this industry, if you, want to, if you have a fantastic invention that is just going to make the world better, and all you have to do is plug it in and put your mobile here and your internet here, uh, it still takes approximately one year um, between meeting someone and telling them about it and uh, actually uh, getting paid for it. Um, so uh, when you go to a trade show like that, you need to get a whole bunch of uh, people and start lining them all up and just uh, methodically going through and, and offering them your system and flying over and showing it to them. And uh, that's what we've been doing. So we offer them free trials. Uh, everyone who has been interested, we get one of, our, one of our people flies over and gives them a sales call, reminding them of what the system does, because they saw so many things at the trade show, and saying, OK, would you like to take a free trial of the system? And they typically say yes, which is very nice. And then we uh, give them some time to uh, figure out who's going to be responsible. And then we fly back for an integration workshop where we figure out exactly how we're going to fit it into their network, uh, how this uh, should all go. And when that looks uh, good enough, then uh, we figure out how the hardware will be arranged. Uh, either they get it or we supply it. Sometimes we bring the fancy network cards, that kind of thing. Then we go over and install it for about a week in some exotic country and test and measure it for about another week as well to establish what the effect is and see what tools they use for measuring their network and demonstrate to them in terms that, uh, that they're comfortable with uh, what the effect of the system is, and present the results and help them present a business case to, uh, to their uh, um, bosses. And yeah, that's what we're doing. And it's going really well. <laughs> um, so it does, it does take a really long time. But now we've, we've successfully integrated uh, our products into, into quite a few networks. The biggest of which was running 13 gigabits a second, uh, which we put in two servers for, and it just took, took everything very gracefully. We've completed several trials now with very good results, uh, totally in line with what we've, been, um, what we've been expecting based on our own measurements. Uh, we seem to get uh, consistently into commercial uh, negotiations following a trial with good results. And we have actually sold a system as well, which is a, a fantastic uh, milestone. And it's, it's really great to see it uh, in production. So we have uh, at least one really wonderful success story in the pipeline where when they switched, uh, switched on our box, it increased the total aggregate throughput of the network by 10%. And they've spent hundreds of millions on building this network. And they were just wasting 10% uh, of the radio capacity. So uh, we, we are really hoping to go back uh, next uh, February uh, to the GSM Congress again and, and have a success story like this and uh, line up more and more and more. And um, yeah, onward from here. So we have a product, we have a, have a product, we have a company. Uh, it seems like people want to buy it. We are very happy to sell it to them. Uh, we think that there is a place for this product in every single network in the world. There are about 1,000 networks. There are very many countries. Um, it's going to be a lot, of, um, a lot of traveling to exotic places and, uh, and uh, setting things up and integrating them. Uh, once we have built our fantastic sales network and uh, customer have uh, wonderful customer relationships everywhere. We will be building more products and creating a, a fantastic uh, telecommunications uh, technology emporium. And uh, generally, we will be hacking Lisp and uh, seeing the world and having fun. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we will be needing some help for this uh, over time. Um, so we're growing slowly but cautiously. But you know, when it when it pinches, then we need to uh, to bring in uh, very very good help. And uh, you know, it, it uh, starts to pinch. So uh, if, if this sounds like something that would be an exciting use of your fantastic uh, list packing talents, then uh, do mention it to us uh, so we can keep you in mind. And uh, that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. Any questions? So. Uh, we are extreme pragmatists. So uh, if I tell you the history of our, um, of our main traffic engine. So it started off as a very, very small list program of maybe uh, one or 2,000 lines. Uh, it was a very flexible TCP that we did a whole lot of different stuff with. And we used that. In that, in that sense, we were doing 
our initial tests just with basically one, uh, one client at a time, uh, you know, kind of a proof of concept prototype kind of a phase. And then we had no, no issues of garbage collection of, of any kind. So then when we came to the point that we had committed to this uh, problem uh, as, as what we wanted to solve and figured out what all of our algorithms were, frankly, we just rewrote it in C. Um, by that point, uh, we, we had a good enough understanding. Technically, it's basically a lot of state machines. And uh, yeah, we just took, took what we learned from the Lisp and, and hacked it in C. And uh, that's worked out really well for us. So what's the place of Lisp in your current system? Sir? Uh, so what's the place of, uh, for Lisp in the current this box? Uh, which role does it play? Uh, OK. So um, uh, in the box, it doesn't do so much. In the box, all of our operation and maintenance uh, is done in Lisp. So uh, the system is configured by Lisp. It is monitored by Lisp um, and, uh, and glued together with Lisp. So where we mostly use Lisp is on the parts that we don't ship. So for example, all of those uh, graphs that I showed you, and even funkier ones, which I will pull up, which uh, I had meant to show, like, um, like this, uh, which is an analysis of a complete uh, web page load of the New York Times with all of its many uh, connections side by side. So this uh, is, is all written in Lisp. And I think the majority of lines of code that we've written uh, are still well in uh, Lisp more than anything else. Um, but in terms of what we uh, actually ship on the box, that's um, uh, Lisp for, for middleware and configuration and operation and maintenance. Um, I have two rather technical questions. Um, one thing, you have showed the throughput graph, um, and it was bimodal, uh, two maxima. Do you have an explanation for this? Yes, I have, Christoph. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's a fantastic question. So uh, we had our prototype, and yes, every packet, every data packet that comes through, we acknowledge immediately, and then we are responsible for its onward transmission. So we're not allowed to free that memory until the acknowledgement has ult ultimately come, which of course can be basically arbitrarily long because networks are really crazy. And we sat down at the whiteboard in the office and had many different models by which you could estimate. You know, when you go from a one machine prototype, when you actually just sit on the backbone of a network and you have, for instance, 13 gigabits a second of traffic, including everybody's viruses and torrents and all of this crap, how much memory are you actually going to need to have? And I mean, we were really fortunate because RAM is not as expensive as it used to be. So we made a standard dimensioning guideline that uh, for a standard deployment, we would recommend uh, 96 gigabytes of RAM to be uh, fairly safe and conservative. Uh, and then when we actually got into production, I think we found we use about 100 megabytes uh, typically or something like this. <laughs> So, so um, it, it, we, we will see if traffic profiles change in the future or, or whatever. Maybe it goes up by a factor of 10, 100. We, we are just uh, happy that... Uh, <laughs> and we have had some awkward questions when uh, customers log in and, and see, hey, uh, you, know, you, you asked for 96 gigs, or we negotiated you down to 48 gigs, and you're, you're not even using one. <laughs> We're like, well, sorry, we, we really want, didn't want to ruin your network. We wanted to be very conservative. The RAM was not so expensive. And, Thanks for that very good question. <laughs> yes. Uh, it costs. So uh, it costs. So we're selling it for the price that we think it should uh, go for, which is very nice. Um, so. <laughs> so. Uh, it's uh, basically for, for a small network, uh, for any kind of a box like this, it's typically in hundreds of thousands of euros is the price tag, and for a large network, it's in it's in millions. And this has been our assumption that this is what people would be prepared to pay for something like this. And it seems, uh, from our experience so far, that this is uh, entirely reasonable. Um, so I, I would say, most importantly, um, the language should match the person uh, using it. And it, people should be hacking with what they like. So for everybody in this room, I would suggest that Lisp is, is the right choice, because you would just find it 
a lot more fun than hacking Erlang. And similarly for, for Erlang hackers, I think there's not a lot to be gained from using Lisp for, for relatively general things. So, um, so for me personally, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, probably foremost a Lisper, right? But if you sit me down and start saying bad things about fourth, I can't uh, promise which side of the argument I'm going to be on. Uh, so, you know, I have uh, loyalties to a whole lot of languages. And, and to me, whatever gets the job done nicely. I mean, we have C++ code that Yuho is writing that to me actually looks like really nice code. I would never have dreamed I could say that of C++ code. But when, when you see it and you think, okay, that, that looks totally fine, then uh, uh, so, so roundabout, I think they're both uh, totally uh, fantastic for very many things. And I think, I think for us, probably most of the stuff that we do, um, since we have such good programmers who are trained on Lisp and have, you know, uh, very, very good skills. I think uh, whether we did it in Lisp or Python or Erlang, I think uh, all of the stuff that we could do, it's, it's the people rather than the language, uh, I think. Um, so I think the great thing about Lisp is the Lisp programmers are so smart. Yes. Thank you very, very much.